welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Gene Chaparral. Today with us, a fascinating guest. His name, Bill Boggs. Many of you remember Bill Boggs as a fantastic TV host. Well, since those days, he's also authored a few books and he's now living with a fantastic woman named Jane Rothschild, who we will meet later on in the show. In addition, we know Bill Boggs as a great journalist. Let's all welcome Bill Boggs. And Bill, it is so nice to have you on Successful Philanthropy. And hold it down, folks. Hold it down. Thank you. Good to be with you, Jean. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I understand you've had quite a career as a TV host, and you're also known as a great comedian. Tell me, what was your favorite show that you hosted? The favorite show that I hosted? I think the favorite show that I hosted was uh, Comedy Tonight. It was a syndicated series. It was on 121 stations for two years, and it grew out of an idea that uh, I had with my business partner, Richard Baker, where we realized in the early 80s that because of Saturday Night Live, there had been an enormous explosion in the number of comedians who were working in America. I started my career managing a comedy team and writing and producing comedy. And so when I really, I read this article in the New York Times about how there were comedy clubs springing up all over the country, and I computed that maybe we could do a late night series, half hour show, that was just stand up comedians. And we took this to a major syndicator, the same people who were syndicating the Phil Donahue show. They loved the idea because it was comedy, it was late night. And the show ended up booking, in the course of a couple of years it was on all over the country, 423 comedians appeared on, on the program, among them, Richard Belzer, Whoopi Goldberg, comedians on the way up like Bill Maher. And I think that the, the I, from sitting at a table, reading the New York Times, seeing this, having the idea hit me to getting the business deal to producing the show that was on all over the country while I was still hosting midday during the day. I, was, I worked nine, seven day weeks a couple times a year, 63 straight days on camera in order to pull it off. That was my favorite show. And in addition, you were also the host of several other shows, one being a food show where you would bring on a celebrity and you would review restaurants. What was that like? That must have been a lot of fun. Well, actually, yeah, that was I was on the Food Network. That, that's a good question, Jean. I appreciate your asking about it. Um, on Midday, the, the big show I did in New York for 13 years, 90 Minutes Live, once a week, we had a, a round table with guests. And so actually I pioneered the concept, Gene, of eating and being on television at the same time. That lofty notion can be ascribed to me. Uh, I hope they put that, in the, it's the only sentence I'll get in my obit in the New York Times. But anyway, I took that to when I was working as an anchor weekend today in New York. Then we did restaurant reviews. And then when I went to the, the, the Food Network, I had the idea, because I like interviewing, just like you do, that to interview celebrities in their favorite restaurants. So the line I like, I, we did a lot of shows, Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York, Sophia Loren, Maury Povich, Whoop, Whoopi Goldberg, Matt Lauer. I know you'll probably have to, you know, blop out his name, bleep out his name. But we did a lot of different, a lot of different shows. And so it was an interview show set in a restaurant. We weren't reviewing the restaurant. That was another show I did with Nina Griscom, the restaurant review show, TV Diners. That was a lot. People in show business say it, and generally it's overused, but it was really a lot of fun. And plus, the way I look at it is, the Food Network actually paid me a pretty good fee to have lunch with Sophia Loren. So not a bad deal, right? I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure you had a great time and who doesn't love food? And uh, tell me a little bit about some of the stars you met. I understand you were close to Frank Sinatra and then you well, knew Sophia Loren. Uh, tell me about Sophia Loren. Did a romance begin or what happened well, no, exactly? I, I actually know. Um, I actually did not have a romance with Sophia Loren. You know, she was a little too young for me at the time, you know, <laughs> when I met her. Uh, but the, you know, when you are, 
in media and you're on television, you end up meeting a lot of different people. They come through your show and some you wish that you could just really get to be friends with. I always liked so much the, the Tony Curtis, the actor Tony Curtis, the actor Kirk Douglas, and they were on a couple of shows and I always wished that I, you know, Kirk Douglas said, the next time you're in LA, come to my house and it, it never quite worked out. But um, I know as the years go by, I wouldn't say I was close to Frank Sinatra. I knew Frank Sinatra. I did the longest interview with him of, of, of his life uh, on television. And uh, he gave, you know, when you, you want to talk about philanthropy, Sinatra, who was, uh, if anybody doesn't know who he is, one of the most notable singers and Academy Award winning actor, is probably has been described, Gene, as the star who raised more money, more philanthropic uh, endeavors through his talents uh, than than any other than any other star, and um, I I attended a lot of those shows every year for six or seven years. He did a massive sellout at either Radio City Music Hall or Lincoln Center, which was a, a fundraiser for the Memorial Sloan Kettering Pediatric Pavilion and Memorial Sloan Kettering and. I mean, he brought in one one year he had Pavarotti, the next year he had uh, Ella Fitzgerald and, and and Benny Goodman. Uh, he always brought in a couple of major stars. Yes, and, and of course, Frank raised a huge amount of money for Israel. He, 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 the hospital that Sinatra built in Israel for both Jewish and Palestinian children still is in operation. And that's quite amazing. When most people think of Frank Sinatra. Uh, they think of his music and then they think of his love life, not his philanthropy. Yeah. And so it's nice to hear about his philanthropy and that yeah. he has this other side to him. Now, this interview is about you, Bill Box. And speaking of philanthropy, I understand you have never turned down an offer uh, oh, to serve as an MC yeah. of an event. Is that true? You know, who told you that? You know, when I knew when I knew Gene that I was going to be talking to you today about philanthropy, I thought, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about how the arts community supports philanthropy. In, in my small way, in my small way, over the years, when I've certainly had a higher profile than I do now. Now I'm essentially an author of comedic novels, but. I never turned, if, if someone called the American Cancer Society, the Alzheimer's Association, I got involved with Sloan Kettering because of the, the Sinatra thing. Um, scleroderma, that's just off the top of my head. To ask me to show up and MC an event, if I were free that evening or that afternoon, or even in two cases that morning, Gene, I would just go. You know, I, I thought the least I can do is something like that. And uh, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like, yeah, Cancer Smancer, we support that organization. But I'll tell you one, I, I actually, for a while, Gene, uh, I produced six shows. Uh, two were at the Waldorf, uh, two were at the Carlisle, and two were at the Pierre, you know, the ballrooms there, Gene. And I produced them for a couple of different charities over the years, Scleroderma, and the, again, the pediatric pavilion at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I produced the shows and I hosted the shows. I'll tell you a story. I have, I've, not told, I've never told this story before. The, um, I booked the following talent. The comedian Robert Klein, who was a hugely successful comedian, a couple dozen HBO specials, and in a way is a bridge between George Carlin and, and Jerry Seinfeld as observational humor. And... Um, Marvin Hamlish, the composer who, who wrote, among other things, a chorus line, uh, the music to the, the way we were, they're playing our song. And he, he himself, a huge donor of his time. And Sarah Jessica Parker, who people know, of course, from oh, Sex, Sex in, in the, the City. City. That's right. Sex so, City. People are coming in, they're spending a lot of money per ticket, Jane. You know what these events are like. You've been to more of them than anybody I probably know. So, and a lot of the people, were coming from Greenwich, Connecticut and Connecticut. And the event, I thought, you know what, we have to get this event over so that they can get to a train to get home at a decent time. 
Because my personal objection to events that start at night, they go on too long. Let's get to it. If you have, if you need a good auctioneer, you get Bill McCutty, you get somebody to move right through it, bam. So I figured we're gonna do a one hour show. And the whole time I'm looking at my, my, my clock, right? We're open with Robert Klein. Robert, you'll do 20 minutes, 18 to 20 minutes. Then Marvin, same thing. You'll do 18 to 20 minutes. And then Sarah Jessica Parker, you'll close the show with 15 minutes and we'll have a solid one hour show. We're gonna end this thing. People are gonna donate more money next year because they were able to make the 1010 train, okay? So I get up there, I'm emceeing the show. Thank you for coming, blah, blah, blah. I, sing, I sang a song, everything was great. I walked around saying, you're the tops because people were so generous. And now to kick things off, Robert Klein. And what does Robert Klein do? 45 minutes, <laughs> 45 <laughs> minutes. I'm looking, I'm sweating, holy. Then Marvin, Marvin Hamish, who's a friend of mine, comes up to me and says, Bill, if Robert has done 45 minutes, I can't, I can't do 20 minutes. I have to do more time. So he, he does 40 minutes. Now we've burned through an hour. And then I still have Sarah Jessica Parker, who was at least gracious enough to only do 20 minutes. And everybody missed their train, right? I mean, anyway. Huh? That was, oh, that that was Robert Klein. God, God bless him. One time I was one time I was emceeing a, a charity show at Carnegie Hall, and the main attraction, you know, people will pay the money because they want to see like they go see Sinatra and his guests. The entertainment for this show was an artist. He's sort of become forgotten as Victor Borga. He was a Danish piano player and wit named Victor Borga. B O R G A. So, Victor Borg is the same thing. By the time he comes on, after all the awards have been given out, the trophies and thanking people, it's late already. And so I'm with Victor Borg, and they say, Victor, just a half hour. We got to wrap this up. Victor Borg passes the half hour mark, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, he's in the 50 minutes. And get this, the head of the charity pulls me aside and says, Bill, you're the MC. Stop him. Yes. The middle <laughs> of the show. I, yeah. I can walk out on stage. Yeah. Excuse me. What? You have to stop now. Yeah. It's yeah. the most embarrassing moment other than the time I fell asleep on my television show and yeah. fell off my stool and live TV. That's the second most embarrassing moment for him. Yeah. Now, career. we're going to switch subjects now. I'm going to stop you as well. And <laughs> I want to hear about your, your latest book, Spike the Wonder Dog. Oh, thank you. And you just wrote a book all about a dog you had in the beginning of your TV career, Spike. Yes, and it's a novel. Dog, it's, yeah. It's, go yes, ahead. But this dog must have had a major effect on you for you to want to write a book about a dog, correct? Well, it, it, that's partially correct and partially incorrect. I had a dog. The dog was on television with me before I came to New York, and the dog was hugely popular, and he was killed by a drunk driver before I came to New York. He was very funny, and his nickname was Spike the Wonder Dog. So when my last show, a PBS show, My Generation, went off the air, I said to Jane, I'm going to just focus on writing now. I've written two other books. I wrote one other novel that was an option by Renee Zellweger and a self-help book. And the idea that I had was, what if Spike hadn't gotten killed? What if he had come with me to New York in today's world and become a big TV star? So the book is called The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog as told to Bill Box. And it is, the dog narrates the book and it's, it, he has been described, Spike the Wonder Dog has been described by critics, not me, although I agree with them, as the funniest dog ever to appear in fiction. This is a satire of cultural mores and norms and certainly of the television business. And on the back at the bottom, I insisted that Post Hill, the press, the publisher, put in a portion of the proceeds for the sale of this book will be donated to animal rescue charities. Because one of the things that happens in the events of Spike the Wonder Dog, as told to Bill Boggs, is he's kidnapped and he's forced into a terrible situation. So that's what I'm doing now, and I'm, I'm working on the sequel, Jane. I'm working on a sequel called Spike Unleashed. 
Well, I love it. And for our viewers, we are with Bill Boggs. He is a former TV host. He's an author and a journalist. And right now we're going to bring on the show his partner, a lovely woman. She's also involved or has been involved in the TV world. Her name, Jane Rothschild. Let's all welcome Jane. And the two of you together, I understand you've been a, 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 in a love relationship for 10 I'm, years. I'm, she is the light of my life. The, Jane, the brain Rothschild, referred to her by her friends as Lady Jane. Get ready, folks. Behold the beauty. Behold Stop. the beauty. Stop. Behold, Stop. Hurry up. Hurry up. behold, Stop. behold the beauty. There she is. And Jane has a list of the charities and the things that we've, that we've supported. I do but indeed. before I hear that, Jane, I want to hear a little bit about you, and so does our audience. You were involved as the producer of a very important TV show. Tell us a little bit about that first. Thank you. Well, I, I started working for a game show production company, Bob Stewart Productions, and the show that was the most successful was, it started as the $10,000 pyramid, it then graduated to the $20,000 pyramid. After I left, it became the $100,000 pyramid, quite honestly, but it was a wonderful show and, and uh, successful, and I actually won two Emmys producing it, and Dick Clark was the host. You won Emmys? I won Emmys, and it was a lot of fun. So that was a uh, part of my earlier, earlier life. In fact, Bill and I, it's funny that we, we met 10 and a half years ago. She picked me up, Jane. Oh, I like that. Oh, oh. Yeah. oh yeah. I have a lot of chutzpah. A Chirco restaurant. <laughs> she picked me up. But, I mean, the funny thing is we traveled in the same circles in New York. I'd be with Dick during the day taking Pyramid. Dick and Bill, Bill would be with, with him at a party that night. Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah. Joan Rivers, you know, she'd be taping. Our show was all celebrities. Yeah. And we traveled in the same circles, but didn't meet until 10 and a half years ago. All right. Yeah. And my first job was working, actually, for Johnny Carson. So, and then I left TV. Can you believe she worked for Johnny Carson? She worked with Dick Clark and she ends up with me? <laughs> <laughs> that's really, that's really going downhill. This is a true love story from what I can see. And it's nice to see that people later on midlife or, or a little older fall in love and they're together and Thank you. I know right now I don't know where you live but I'm hearing you're out of New York coming back to New York or East Hampton and oh you know, yeah um, we move around well we we, we have a, a home East Hampton is absolutely where I consider my home we're, we're, we're blessed that we have a Palm Beach pad and a little apartment in New York and we are we are we know how lucky we are and how wonderful our life is. We don't take any anything for granted. But I consider East Hampton my, my home now. I do. And I understand. And I'm a resident of the Hamptons as well. And for our viewers, uh, we are with this lovely couple, uh, Jane Rothschild and Bill Boggs. And now we're going to hear a little bit about their philanthropy. Bill has spoken a little bit about his and Jane yeah. is going to tell us a little bit about what they do together. And I think yeah. for our viewers, so many people forget that the celebrities are very involved in philanthropy. And so, um, Jane, tell us a little bit about some of the work you do and some of the charities you like to support. Well, the one thing, let me just before Jane, I'll preface that by saying I have found in, in my career that celebrities, pe pu people in the public eye, really will go out of their way to help raise money. And in the time I was on the Food Network, the, the, the food community would do amazing things to try to help feed the hungry. But go ahead, Jane. No, I'm just thinking, and we support the arts. I mean, so for Guildhall, Kravis Center here in Palm Beach. Bay Street. Um, belong to the, the society, the, the um, Chamber Music Society of Palm Beach, Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor, so many. And then we had friends this year who, because so many venues have closed, they're doing podcasts. So we're then supporting them. We're sending checks to them because they haven't had income. Yeah. So we're we're now supporting individual artists who have podcasts. Her, I love animals, so I. I know, are, Jane. I, I um I always a in the, in the ASPCA ARF, uh, Peggy Adams here in Palm Beach. Um, uh, I I have a list here. 
to children's things, Make-A-Wish Foundation, uh, ACLU, I believe in, you know, Project Innocence. There are many projects. And then of course, Alzheimer's, cancer, Parkinson's, we give to St. Jude's Hospital. Yeah. Um, it's giving back is so important. It's so, so important. Yep. So I the, you, you, you mentioned Joan Rivers before. When I, when I was doing the last show I did, My Generation, <clears throat> I, I found it was easy to book relatively, to big name guests, if I could tie it into a charity. So for example, I've known Joan for a while. We, we did the Food Network show. We've done like probably five different shows together. But in order to get her to do this PBS show, I said, Joan, can we do something with God's love we deliver? And she, I, just yes. It wasn't like, oh, uh, talk to my people. Yes. Uh, just exactly, exactly like that. And that's and, just, go ahead, Jane. No, it's great to hear because there's no question when you have a platform as our, so many of our celebrities have massive platforms you can do great good with that platform and you can motivate others to give, get involved in philanthropy. And for our viewers, if you don't have a big thick wallets right now and you've been hit by this COVID pandemic in a big way, you can always volunteer your time. You can write smaller checks. You can get involved in really helping. And of course, for our, our very wealthy people watching, it's always very important to open up your heart and your wallets. Now, Bill, one of the things I like to ask my guests is, is there one charity in particular that you would like to see funded, especially now during the pandemic? Well, I continue to be horrified at the problem of hunger in America, Jane. I just continue to be horrified by that. I think we're coming out of the pandemic. I, I, I read what a statistic, one, four out of every 10 families in America do not have enough to eat. So if I could, if I could wave a wand and a lot of money would go pouring into something, it would, it would be feeding hungry people decent food, not fast food, not empty calories, not something that's going to lead to overweight and diabetes, but healthy food, to hungry people. There is no excuse that the, in the United States of America, we have four out of every 10 families hungry, stories of little children going to school without food. It's just, it's heartbreaking to me. How about you, Jane? Okay. You agree with uh, uh, I agree with you, Bill. What? I do, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and I agree with you also, and one of America's largest charities dealing with, or, or the largest dealing with food insecurity is Feeding America. And their website is feedingamerica.org. And I've been a, a involved in helping them through my TV show and other uh, TV platforms. On Long Island, we have Long Island Cares, another great group that feeds people. In East Hampton, we have the East Hampton Food Pantry. In Southampton, we have Heart of the Hamptons. There are food pantries all across the United States helping people with food insecurity. And right now we have terrible, terrible food insecurity. Yeah. And I love that the two of you are interested in so many different groups, helping so many people, because I have just interviewed two great philanthropists, Bill Boggs and Jane Rothschild. And Bill and Jane, we have about two minutes left. That's it. What do you want to leave our audience with? I'll, I'll kick it off. I think that giving, giving, truly giving of yourself, giving of your time, even if you don't have a giant bank account, you know, when you talk about the food pantries, there are people there who volunteer their time to hand over. It's more than ever before. I've seen neighborhoods who I don't remember where I, I couldn't believe the pe people lined up around the block to get food. So I think the one thing I would say would be the value of giving of yourself. The, the reward in a selfish sense will come back to you, but to give of yourself, give of your time, volunteer, do what it takes to help make, help us solve some of the terrible problems we have. 
I, mean, I agree with that. I just flashed on something that I do. I, I also give to a, an organization called Dress for Success. Oh, right. Yeah. I, I love to shop, truthfully. And I go, I mean, I, ha I have a lot and then I have to clean out the closet. And it's a pleasure for me to give clothing away and give it to an organization like Dress for Success where people who, who go on job interviews look good. Everything you, you, you get. Yeah, it's a great organization. Purses. Yeah, you know, um, I bring it back to Frank Sinatra. He had a notable quote. Frank Sinatra says, if you, if you have a possession that you cannot give away, then it possesses you. And that's an interesting, stop and think about that. Well, that was a fun show. Thank you so much, Bill Boggs, Jane Rothschild. We really had a great time. I'm Jean Chaffroff, your host. I'll see you next week.